to Or Kadash 2020 Insights. We want not only 2020 hindsight, but we want 2020 insight. As always, we, we sing a little bit, give people a chance to come on live. <clears throat> but for those who are tuned in already, uh, we're going to be talking about the Arizal. As here in Eretz Yisrael, it's uh, 8 o'clock, which is we're finishing the yurt site of the Arizal. And outside of Israel, uh, you still have time to celebrate this incredible neshama, the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. Since we're getting close to Tisha B'Av, we'll sing a little bit about Yerushalayim and our hope to rebuild Yerushalayim, see the ingathering of the exiles and the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. Yerushalayim, Yerakodesh, Oven a year shall lie, Oven a year shall lie, Ere a cold as pain, Distracting, but I see that someone that peers went to high school with me <laughs> just uh, tuned in. Now we're talking, I don't want to give away my age, but we're talking <laughs> about quite a long time ago. Anyways, I'm very glad to make your acquaintance again after um, quite a long time. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the Arizal. The series is called 2020 Insights. My idea is 20 minutes more or less of Torah, not too long, not too short. 
but truthfully, we would need 20 hours, 20 days, 20 weeks to talk about the awesome neshama of the Arizal and the contribution he made to the Jewish people. So what I'd like to try to accomplish tonight is give a very, very short uh, biography of the Arizal. It is super fascinating in of itself. And then the last half to try to explain what exactly is the contribution that the Ari made. And again, in 20 short minutes, it's, it's close to mission impossible, but we'll do our best. So the Arizal was born in 1534 in Yerushalayim. And according to tradition, the place, for those people who know Yerushalayim, in the old city, there is a street called the uh, Rehov Orachaim, uh, the great uh, sage who moved from Morocco. And he established his yeshiva in the place where, according to tradition, the Arizal had his Brit, his circumcision. Is he, the Ari was born in Yerushalayim, and shortly after he was born, his father passed away. And his, his mother was left practically uh, penniless. It turns out that she had a very, very rich brother in Egypt. And so when the Arizal was five years old, they moved to Egypt where uh, the Ari's uncle basically took him under his wing an extended family, and he supported the family. The Ari was a child prodigy. Everyone saw it at a very, very young age. He had mastered uh, virtually the entire written and oral tradition. One of his teachers was the Radbaz. He was the senior rabbi of Egypt at that time. And it's interesting that even though we're talking about 500 years ago, when the Ethiopian Jews came to Israel and because they had been gone so long, there was a whole question about their Jewishness. And ultimately they depended on a, an opinion by the Radbaz that confirmed their religiousness, their, their Jewish heritage. When the Ari, it came time for him to be married. So he did what it, it, it was very, very common in Jewish circles until recently, and even in many circles, it still is. He married his uncle's daughter, his first cousin. And then for seven years, he learned privately with Reb B'Tzalel, Who's called, who wrote a very, very famous uh, explanation of the Talmud called Shita Mikubetzit. And in fact, the Ari actually helped him write some of the parts of Shita Mikubetzit. And he, for almost seven years, he learned with Rav Bitsalo and mastered the entire tradition. And during that time, though, he was exposed to the inner dimensions of the Torah, the Kabbalah. And after that, for another approximately 13 or 14 years, even though he had a family, and he actually worked for his uncle. His uncle was very, very wealthy, and he was in the uh, business of collecting customs. And the Ari did some work for him, but basically for 20 years, he delved into the Torah. And around 14 of those was into the inner dimensions of the Torah, especially the Zohar HaKodesh. And it was known that the Ari learned day and night. And he, he would not move from a, a, a passage of the Zohar until he felt that he understood it to its ultimate depths. During that time, according to tradition, Eliyahu and Navi, Elijah the prophet, began to come to him and reveal Torah that had never been revealed in this world 
until that point. When the Arizal was approximately 35 or 36 years old, after really 20 years of learning in deep, intense isolation, Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet, told him that he actually didn't have that much longer in the world and that he needed to move to Tzfat. And there he needed to give over all the Torah he had been learning. And the Arizal, who is a very private, inner person, was... It didn't sit well with him. He, he was perfectly happy to sit with Eliyahu and Nabi and, and learn Torah. And Eliyahu revealed to him that all the Torah he had been taught from heaven was meant to come into the world and not just for him. But he only really had to teach one person. And he identified him, Rabbi Chaim Vital. And so at the age of 35, 36, Yarizal moved to Tzfat with his family. And because there he didn't have a source of income, he actually opened up a store and he made a living doing business. And every other spare moment was in giving over this Torah, especially to Rabbi Chaim Vital. The Arizal was in spot for approximately two and a half years. And what is mind blowing, it's absolutely mind blowing, is in those two and a half years, the Torah he gave over to Rabbi Chaim Vital changed Jewish thought radically revolutionary because we have to understand the, the, the Torah that the Arizal was teaching was in a sense brand new. Now he, uh, he gathered this information and, and this insight from the Zohar itself, but for most people even to today, the Zohar is, is like a closed book. It is so symbolic and its language is, is, is so difficult that most people cannot really, without, without a teacher, crack the code of the Zohar. But the Ari not only cracked the code, but he was such an innovative mind. And he was a vessel for these new teachings to come into the world that until this day, all of Jewish thought, especially uh, Kabbalistic thought, but really all of Jewish thought and practice, by the way, was changed radically by the revelations of the Arizal. And all of this was given over in just two and a half years. And what happened in the end, and we can relate to today, there was a plague that came through Sfat, and it, it killed untold amounts of people, including the Arizal and many of, his, many of his students. So the Arizal left this world at the age of 38 years old. But again, during those two and a half years, what he gave over changed forever Jewish thought. Now, Rabbi Chaim Vital, who himself was brilliant beyond brilliant, he took more than 15 years to uh, organize and categorize and clarify the teachings that he had been taught. And with his son, his son was instrumental, Shmuel Vital, that 15 to 20 years later, after the Arizal had passed away, the teachings of the Arizal were, in a sense, released to the world in eight volumes called the Kitvei Ha'ari, or the Eight Zechayim. And so these, 
all Kabbalistic thought follows the Arizal. And what, what is important to understand is all Hasidic thought follows the Arizal. Because the Baal Shem Tov, what, what the Baal Shem Tov did, he understood the Ari to the, to the depths. But the Ari was not giving over Kabbalah to the masses. He was giving it over to very, very uh, elevated high neshamas. And really, and even expressed it, the only one that he thought really understood what he was talking about was Reb Chaim Vital. And so all of Hasidic thought, what the Baal Shem Tov did is he took these very, very uh, high, elevated, complicated, complex teachings of the Arizal, and he created a new language, in a sense, to give over these teachings. And so all of Hasidic thought is per, per, permeated with the teachings of the Arizal, but in a more simple form. And all the teachings of Hasidus have influenced all of Jewish thought. So that, in, in short, is a little bit about the Arizal. But I, what we don't have time to give over are the amazing stories about people who were in contact with the Ari and the stories they reported about his, we'll just call it his prophetic powers. Unfortunately, in the short time we have, we can't go into that. But anyone who wants to Google um, stories about the Arizal, uh, he was he had such uh, prophetic powers that quite, un quite unique from the time of the, the prophecy ended in Israel. So the rest of the time we have tonight, I do want to dedicate to explaining one concept that in a sense runs through all of the Ari's teachings. So there is a teaching within Chabad Hasidus that we can categorize the development of Kabbalah into three progressions. The first progression is called Hishtalshalut. Hishtalshalut means like a chain of cause and effect or a hierarchy. In other words, this leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to this. Everything is very ordered and like I said, like, kind of like a chain, a cause and effect, Hishtalshalut. And this was considered the type of, of Kabbalah that was from ancient times until right before the Ari, and through the Ramak, Rabbi Moshe Kordobero. And then the innovation of the Ari is called Hit Lab Shut, enclothement. What does this mean, enclothement? That until then, <clears throat> when we discussed about, let's say, the 10 spherot or the 10 or, or the four worlds or the five levels of the soul or the four letters of God's name. Everything was in an in a orderly fashion, one thing leading to the other. What the Ari revealed, and we're going to see just a few examples, is how everything is enclosed in everything else. In other words, he turned, in a sense, Kabbalah, which was, as it were, one-dimensional into a multi-dimensional uh, understanding of the world. And I'll just bring one example is when we do Sphira to Omer, when we count the 49 days from Pesach to Shavuos. So each day when we count the Omer, we count the spirit, the ten di di uh, divine emanations, along with them. So every day, let's say the first week is the week of chesed, the week of loving kindness. <clears throat> but until the Ari, you looked at chesed, and, and that's what you saw. But the Ari revealed that 
all of the other spherot are inside of it. That's why the first day is chesed sheva chesed, and the second day is gevura sheva chesed, and the third day is teferet sheva chesed, and onward and onward. And the third development of Kabbalah was from the Ari to the Baal Shem Tov, and that is called Hashra'a. Hashra'a, in a sense, means direct divine experience of, <clears throat> of taking this, this multidimensional reality and integrating it in the mind and the heart and the one's inner consciousness. So this, the, the Chiddush, the innovative idea of the Arizal was this idea of enclosement. And just to explain what this means, and, and much of this, the, the Ari explained in great de depths. An example of enclosement is that God is enclosed in the world. The world enclothes God. And we see this, that one of the names of God, Elohim, equals the word Hateva, which means nature with a capital N. So within nature, nature encloses a divine reality, a divine force. This is the same thing as the body encloses the soul. The soul is enclosed in the body like God is enclosed in the world. In modern physics, we see this also, <clears throat> that now we know that matter is really energy. Matter encloses energy. <clears throat> and finally, that physical material reality encloses a spiritual dimension. So all of these are examples of enclosement, and each one of these things, the Ari gave over in great depths, in great depths of how the body encloses the soul, how nature encloses God. And he already, way before quantum physics, modern physics, was explaining how matter is energy and physicality enclosed spirituality. So the same concept of enclosement is another one of the great uh, revelations of the Arizal, and that is Gilgul, reincarnation. Now before the Arizal, the concept of reincarnation was very, very hidden in, in Judaism and only appeared in a number of <coughs> excuse me, mystical texts like the Zohar and the Bahir. In the Bahir, which is over 2,000 years old, the concept of reincarnation is mentioned, but very, very um, subtly. The Zohar, for the first time, speaks about reincarnation more openly. But it was the Arizal, one of the eight volumes of the writings of the Arizal, is dedicated to revealing the, the mechanics and the dynamics of reincarnation. So how does this connect to enclosement? What it's saying is our life now is enclosing previous lifetimes. Previous lifetimes are enclosed within our present reality. Again, we don't have time to delve into all of these ideas, but I, what I'm just trying to give over here is how one concept, enclosement, runs through much of what the Ari was teaching. Another tremendously innovative idea of the Ari, and I, I want to mention here that when I say innovative idea, it doesn't mean that the Ari, no one have ever thought of these things before. But so often, it's 
when someone takes a previous idea and gives it life by expanding on it and making it a, like a major plank. So many of these ideas were, were in the Zohar, but people didn't understand it. And so the Ari took these ideas and expanded them to, to, to such a great extent <clears throat> that for the first time, people began to really understand these mystical teachings. So the next thing that the Ari developed is what are called Yichudim, unifications, where he took words, phrases, parts of prayer, parts of mit, uh, the, the wording of mitzvot, names of God, names of people, etc. And he revealed an entire hidden dimension within them. <clears throat> and most of them were based on unifying different names of God, unifying different letters, different spherot. These are called Yehudim. In other words, he was showing that within <clears throat> the world, there's dimension after dimension after dimension. This is like taking a microscope and let's say putting it on your hand. So we see a hand and we see the outside. But if, if you turn up the microscope, the focus, all of a sudden you can see the cells. You turn it up more and you see all the parts of the cell. As anyone who studies biology, there's, there's a whole world in every cell. And then inside every cell are the atoms. And within the atoms, the worlds, worlds. Part, every, every year now they're discovering new particles. So that's what the Ari did. And we call this kavana, intention. That when we do a mitzvah, or we learn, or we pray. So what's behind the words? What, what do the words mean other than their simple translation? So the Ari opened up an entire world of, of inner dimensions in every letter, every word, every sphere, every divine emanation. And another example are in Kabbalah, we're told that there are four worlds. The Ari actually added a fifth world. And until the Ari, remember we talked about Hishtal Shalut. We talked about a progression. So it was, it was seen that you had the highest world called Atzilut, the world of emanation. And that leads to the world of Bria, the world of creation. And that leads to the world of formation. Olam and that leads to our world of action, Olam Asiya. But the Ari revealed that all the worlds are revealed within each other. This is like a fractal where every part contains all the other parts of the whole. So we see that this concept of enclosement running through all of the teachings, all of the teachings. <clears throat> now, I want to go one more step. And that is the Ari uh, revealed a whole new cosmology. And many of these terms people have heard, and they, very simply, and it's not so simple, <laughs> it's very, very complex. But the Ari explained that when an infinite God wanted to create, so there was a problem because if everything is infinite, where, as it were, would you put a finite world? It's almost uh, oxymoronic to put a finite world within infinity. So the, the, the teaching from the Ari, based on the Zohar, but still people didn't really understand what it meant is that God contracted, as it were, 
his infinite being and created a empty vacuum in which uh, finite worlds could exist. And then he began to fill the worlds with light, but the initial lights were so, were so elevated and strong and pure, they cracked the original vessels in what's called Shvira Takelim, the breaking of the vessels. And these vessels shattered, but within them there were points of light. And he explained that this previous world that broke, the broken vessels of this previous world is what makes up this world. And he called this world Olama Tikkun, the world of rectification. And we know that the concept in, in Judaism, and it runs to every type of, 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 of Jew that there is, from Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Reconstruction, as whatever you want to say. This idea of tikkun olam, rectifying the world. But in large measure, this concept, even though, again, he didn't make it up in the Elenu, prayer that we say three times a day. We end every prayer, every uh, prayer service with the Elenu. We pray to rectify the world in the kingdom of God. So the Ari did not make up this idea of Tikkun Olam, but he placed it in a cosmological way in the center of Ju the Jewish mission is to find, redeem, and elevate these, the brokenness of not just the previous world, but the broken world that we live in. And the mission of the Jewish people is to heal, to rectify, to improve, to spread to spread light. So this perhaps was one of the greatest uh, contributions that the Ari made because he, he, he gave the Jewish people an incredible mission and the Baal Shem picked up on this and, and infused the entire Hasidic movement with this idea. And I want to end with an idea because it turns out that the yurt site of the Ari is uh, the fifth day of Ab, which is exactly the middle of the nine days leading to Tisha B'Av. And on Tisha B'Av, we have a, a tradition that Mashiach is born. And the Ari uh, explicitly explicitly began to talk about that the, the time for exile was coming to a close and a new reality was beginning to appear. And really the teachings of the inner dimensions of the Torah is instrumental in helping to bring the final redemption. So the Ari, this is 500 years ago, but he began, again, he was living in Eretz Yisrael. That this was after this, uh, basically around 70 years after the Inquisition in Spain, 1492. And Jews were wandering the world looking for new homes. And people started to come to Israel, to the four holy cities. And then the Vilna Gaon began sending students. The Baal Shem Tov students began coming. And it, be, it started as a trickle. But in the late 1800s, it became a, a stream. And then it became a, a, a raging river. And here we are in Eretz Yisrael with one foot in exile and one foot in redemption. And the Ari 
began speaking very strongly that something new was about is, is happening. Now it's true, it's taken 500 years, but there has been a, a steady stream of uh, movement from exile to redemption. So we'll end with this idea and we'll just end with a blessing that the world is, is going through a, a very, very painful uh, period right now. Here in Israel also, um, all of our lives have been turned upside down, but we have a firm belief, firm belief, just like on Tisha B'Av, we're sitting on the floor, we're fasting, we're crying about the past, but we're mostly crying about the present, that the temple still isn't rebuilt, the Mashiach still hasn't come, and yet we hold on to the belief that the Mashiach is born on Tisha B'av. The greatest darkness comes before the dawn. So this year, we should merit to see that light of redemption burning stronger. And stronger. It's, already, it's already shining in the world, but we're not quite there yet. And that sometimes that makes it all the more painful because we're so close, so close to redemption that Bezrat Hashem, this year we will all experience the Geula Shalema. Thank you all for tuning in. I just want to tell everyone, Tuesday night at 8 o'clock Israel time, um, we are back with how to prepare spiritually for Tisha B'Av, which is Wednesday night. Everyone's invited, 8 o'clock. Please tune in. Thank you for coming.